What are the effects of loneliness? How do we come to grips with our small place in the universe? Our existence? Do we tacitly accept it and live out our lives? Or do we allow the madness to take us over? These are the questions posed by Martin Scorsese's film Taxi Driver. Travis Bickle is a Vietnam veteran who works the late shift driving a taxi. His loneliness crushes him and affects how he sees New York City. He meets a woman, Betsy, but soon scares her away. He illegally buys guns and prepares to, in his mind, defend himself against the city, but really becomes an unhinged vigilante. He plans to assassinate a politician for reasons only he understands, and when that fails, he plans to violently rescue a child prostitute, partly because of genuine affection for her, but much of what he does is in service of being seen, being noticed. Travis believes, from the vantage point of his taxi, that he knows what the city really is. He believes that rain should wash away the people who he sees as beneath him. His hypocrisy shines through time and time again, as he illegally purchases guns, visits pornographic theaters in the middle of the day, brings his girlfriend to a dirty movie without her knowledge, and so forth. He shoots someone in the head over a small amount of money that isn't even his, a robbery of a cash register that is far from a capital crime. He leaves in a hurry. It becomes clear that this isn't even about Travis's sense of vigilante justice, and more about his desire to pull his gun after so much practice in the mirror. Travis admits to knowing nothing about politics and having no real education, but feels eminently qualified to judge the city. He says this to a politician. Whatever it is, you should clean up this city here, because this city here is like an open sewer, you know? It's full of filth and scum, and sometimes I can hardly take it. Travis's motivations behind his failed assassination of the same politician have less to do with the presidential candidate's politics, we hear very little about his policies in the film, and more to do with our protagonist's rage at the city itself, and his desire to be noticed. He never explicitly states his motive, leaving us to wonder what's going on in his head. Travis's loneliness is shown not only through the voiceover narration, but also visually. Travis desperately tries to apologize to Betsy, a woman he offended. In this scene, as he tries to talk to her, the camera drifts away as we, the audience, become too embarrassed to watch. Even the camera abandons him. Much of the film takes place inside the taxi. From this point of view, we see a skewed version of New York City, late at night, only through rain-soaked windows. This gives us the feeling that Travis doesn't truly see the world, only a washed-out image of it. In one scene, Travis calls himself God's Lonely Man. This isn't entirely an invention of the film, though. Screenwriter Paul Schrader is referencing an essay by Thomas Wolfe. In it, Wolfe asserts that loneliness is a commonality of all men, even if each man believes his feelings are original and unique. Wolfe once wrote, The whole conviction of my life now rests upon the belief that loneliness, far from being a rare and curious phenomenon, is the central and inevitable fact of human existence. Wolf believed that we all think our loneliness to be original and personally heartbreaking, but that's a self-obsessed lie. According to screenwriter Paul Schrader, Taxi Driver came out of his own self-obsessive thoughts and existentialism. As philosophy, existentialism is far-reaching. On one hand, existentialist thought often contradicts predeterminism and suggests that we have agency in our actions. Conversely, existential thought often leads to the idea that our actions, although within our control, may not have all that much consequence. In short, existential thought emphasizes the existence of the individual as an agent of free will, for whatever that is worth. Specific existential references and influences to Taxi Driver come from The Stranger by Albert Camus, Nausea by Jean-Paul Sartre, and Notes from the Underground by Fyodor Dostoevsky. In The Stranger, Merceau seems unable or unwilling to express common feelings about the events of his life. His mother passes away, but he doesn't appear to grieve. He only comments about what others are doing, much like Travis. Both characters have a sort of inaction to them. Travis's loneliness and inaction eventually build up inside him and propel him to violence, which screenwriter Paul Schrader believed to be a distinctly American reaction to such feelings. I really... No, I really want to... I got some bad ideas in my head, I just... Notes from the Underground helped develop Travis's character, especially his attempt to save a child prostitute and the framework of having the film be told in the form of a diary. 
Taxi Driver is steeped in classic literary references and influences, and with these books and ideas and philosophies as support, the film becomes something greater than the story of one troubled man. Some believe existentialism is a morally neutral method of thinking. It's not about what is right and wrong. It's just, who am I? What am I? The answer might be uncomfortable, especially if the answer is, someone unimportant. Probably the most famous line from the film is this. Well, then who the hell else are you talking? You talking to me? Well, I'm the only one here. It sounds like a lot of macho bravado, and it is, but it's also the central theme of the film. I'm the only one here. Loneliness. In voiceover narration earlier in the film, Travis says that he is God's lonely man, and he remarks that Betsy is lonely too. Maybe he's projecting. The setting of New York City is perfect for expanding on the theme of loneliness. Travis is lonely even in crowds. Nobody pays attention to him. Even when someone actually speaks to him in his cab, Travis is not given agency in his actions. The man in the back seat is threatening to murder his own wife. It's dangerous to inform a complete stranger of your intent to commit homicide, but not everyone seems to think of Travis as a real person. Although Travis is the one driving the taxi, it feels more like he is the passenger. Everyone else is driving his life. One interpretation of the ending of the film is that everything following the shootout is only happening in the mind of Travis. The newspaper is calling him a hero and so forth. At a glance, this makes sense. If you look at it a certain way, the ending doesn't entirely fit with the tone of the previous hour and 45 minutes of the film. It's surprisingly upbeat for a story about such a violent, disturbed man. It's so sudden a shift that one might even suspect it was a studio mandate. The dream theory even has popular mainstream acceptance, and there's nothing in the narrative that directly contradicts it. The dream theory even plays into Travis's delusions about thinking he's the hero, even while plotting the assassination of a presidential candidate. Maybe all interpretations of film are valid unless they are directly contradicted by the narrative, but in this particular case, it's worth noting that the screenwriter has debunked it at least as authorial intention. Schrader said that the ending was not meant to be taken as a dream sequence or deathbed delusion. It's more about everything starting over, suggesting Travis hasn't been cured and hasn't completed his arc. So what is the more grounded solution? What is Schrader's explanation? Well, Travis being treated as a hero is not his delusion. It's society's delusion. Travis murdered a group of people. Low lives, but still, that makes him a criminal vigilante. He gunned down a few strangers, and society treated him like a hero. Based on this fact, and because the public doesn't know that he's also a failed political assassin, Travis is held in great esteem by the city and by his peers. The ending is such a sudden shift in tone, deliberately. It shows the glorification of violence by American culture, something deeply coded into this film. And at the very end, Travis's body language suggests that he has not changed. According to Schrader, he is not cured at the end, and Martin Scorsese says that Travis frantically looking into the mirror at an unseen object implies he's a ticking time bomb. Next time, his victims won't be pimps and pushers. This is not a redemptive arc. Everyone wants to be the hero of their own story. We live inside our own minds, and we can't ever experience anyone else's life firsthand. So all we really know is ourselves, if that. We naturally assign ourselves the role of protagonist because we're only following our actions, our decisions. We're following our life story. We want to be the hero of that story. We can't be the villain because people root against the villain, and we can't actively root against ourselves. Our actions are in our own self-interest, which makes rooting against ourselves impossible. So no matter what we do, no matter how flawed or immoral, even if we recognize these things and we're self-aware enough to know the sins we've committed and understand them as such, we still think we're the protagonist of our own lives. And movies make the protagonist out to be the hero. How couldn't we be? When life breaks our hearts and stomps on our dreams, we don't want to think that's cruelty. We just want to think that that's the part of the movie when the protagonist reaches his lowest point. I mean, every screenplay has one. It's usually around the end of the second act. So we want to be the star of our own movie, the hero, because that means that every wrong turn and bad decision is only building up to the redemptive finale. But we're not. We're not the star of the movie. 
were passengers, like Travis, were extras in a much larger story, and the movie goes on without us.